UH-60L mod released about a month ago to a fairly positive response. The UH-60 is the workhorse of the US Army as well as many other nations' militaries, and as such the aircraft would make a great addition to the DCS inventory, and uh, this mod attempts to do this. So I wanted to take a look to see how well it holds up. The UH-60 is personally the aircraft I most want to see in DCS, and I know many others feel the same, and so I want to see it done right. It's also the helicopter I'm probably most familiar with, and so I feel I might have something to contribute here. But because I work in the rotorcraft industry, I can't really work on or contribute to a project like this without it likely being considered a conflict of interest. However, I can point out various issues that I notice, which can be objectively compared to publicly available documents and materials. This review will focus mainly on the 3D modeling and the flight and stability modeling, as these are areas I feel I am most qualified to critique. I will not be focusing on other systems, such as the navigation and communication systems, uh, since that's not really my area of expertise, and correct behavior there can be uh, somewhat readily confirmed by real-life operators or flight manuals. Finally, I will point out that I recognize that this is just a mod made by enthusiasts in their spare time. As such, it would be unrealistic to expect this to be at the same level of quality as a paid module. However, DCS has set a rather high standard for helicopter flight simulation, uh, particularly when it comes to flight modeling. And experiencing the feel of what it's like to fly a particular aircraft is one reason DCS has the appeal that it does. And so, with that in mind, that's the standard to which I will be judging this aircraft. The external model looks alright at first glance. I mean, it resembles a Blackhawk, and you wouldn't mistake it for anything else. Unfortunately, it falls apart under a closer scrutiny. Uh, and issues like these are going to be more apparent to people intimately familiar with the aircraft. So, engineers, pilots, maintainers, those sorts of people. The overall shape is just generally off. To better convey the errors, I've created these overlays that compare the 3D model to some of the best photographic references I could find. Uh, looking at the forward cross section, it's apparent that the widest part of the fuselage is too low, giving the aircraft a bottom heavy look. Uh, the belly is too low, and it's rounded rather than being flat like on the real aircraft. Uh, the main rotor pylon is too small from this point of view as well, especially when you consider that the main rotor pylon in the photo reference already suffers from some shrinkage due to perspective. The main fuselage body is generally too tall or too narrow, depending on the relative scale you choose. Uh, and this is also apparent from the side, the, the main fuselage appears too tall. Uh, and this makes the aircraft feel short and stubby compared to the somewhat more sleek appearance of the real thing. You can also see that the tip of the uh, forward main rotor fairing should be between the eyebrow windows. Uh, the fairing in the 3D model begins too far aft. The main rotor hub lacks the torque offset or pre-lag angle and also the pre-cone angles. Uh, the main rotor blades lack any twist. Uh, and the original model, uh, version 1.0, had a, a very small cant angle in the tail rotor. Uh, this seems to have been corrected to the proper 20 degrees in version 1.1. Uh, there are other minor details. The tail rotor blades are far too thick and uh, lack any twist. The airfoil on the horizontal stab is uh, not shaped correctly. It is lacking some of the access panels and the friction tape on the upper deck. Um, it is missing the uh, wispus cutters on the uh, main landing gear drag beams, uh, despite the presence of the cutters on the, uh, the main rotor fairing. The tailwheel is too large. There is also the incorrect mounting points for the uh, missile warning sensors on the nose. Uh, these should be lower on the UH-60 uh, towards the front of the nose. I've only ever seen these higher mounted ones on uh, Air Force HH-60Gs and Navy MH-60 Sierras. The cockpit geometry is arguably much more important than the external 3D model, as uh, this is where you're going to be flying it from and where you're going to be spending most of your time. Um, at first glance, everything's there. Uh, you can click it, you know, everything appears functional. Um, however, we do have crew station drawings available to us uh, through a NASA report. And uh, comparisons between the actual uh, cockpit geometry and the in-game cockpit geometry show distinct differences um, in, the, in the overall shape uh, and positioning of uh, different items. Uh, there is a large difference, for example, in the size and position of the chin windows. Uh, the main instrument panel and glare shield are also uh, too wide and too high, 
And uh, the Blackhawk already hovers pretty nose up, and uh, there's really no reason to make the over-the-nose visibility even worse. Um, additionally, the visibility out the chin windows is uh, reduced, and this is very apparent in the game. So in essence, you're not really getting the correct view out of the cockpit, and this can have significant implications, uh, particularly during you know, nose-high uh, decelerations and assault-type landings. The texturing in the cockpit could definitely be improved. It's a bit low resolution in places and lacks the detail typically seen in the cockpits of other DCS aircraft. The cyclic stick grip is uh, largely correct, though it should be clocked 15 degrees to the left to make it easier to grip with your right hand. The collective grip, on the other hand, should be significantly reworked. The texturing and some of the switch colors are incorrect and the grip itself lacks the angles, contours, and general shape of the real thing. And uh, also, the collective grip should be below the top of the center console in the fold-down position. Right now, it's uh, too high. The text on the airspeed indicator and some of the other instruments uh, does seem a bit small. And speaking of the airspeed indicator, uh, it does show true airspeed regardless of flight direction. Um, it should show indicated airspeed, and it should also only work well above 40 knots or so. Uh, it should also not display airspeed in side flight, and uh, we'll discuss more about side flight later. Overall, the 3D models appear to me almost like placeholders, functional but temporary. Unfortunately, this likely isn't the case. Uh, people are already making various liveries and paint schemes and such, and treating it like it's the final thing. So overall, the 3D modeling just kind of feels underwhelming. Um, I would recommend to the devs, uh, you know, look at as many reference drawings as possible and verify them against known dimensions from uh, manuals, diagrams, promotional items, etc. Um, there are good reference drawings out there if you know where to look and you know what you're looking at. All references should also be verified against photos. Um, collecting as many reference photos as possible is key, and I'd be happy to share a number of my own that I've taken at uh, air shows and such. Um, I've done a fair bit of 3D modeling myself, and I know how difficult it can be working from limited references. Um, obviously, we can't expect perfection, um, but uh, the current models are quite far from it, unfortunately. And I would love to see all the 3D models receive a uh, complete overhaul in the future. Version 1.1 of the mod was released uh, fairly recently and it makes substantial changes to the aircraft performance. Uh, unfortunately, I had already evaluated the original version uh, prior to the 1.1 release, and so I will be showing and comparing both versions here. I flew the aircraft in forward flight at a variety of speeds, uh, in increments of about 10 knots, and uh, I looked at the engine torque. And I compared this to plots from the UH-60L flight manual, which is often called the, the Dash 10, and I used the uh, the 96 version. It's uh, distribution statement A, meaning all the information is permitted for public release. The aircraft flown in DCS was between uh, 14,000 and 16,000 pounds, depending on how much fuel I had burned. Uh, I believe I began the flight at about 15.5 thousand pounds. The initial version tracked the curve very well until about 140 knots, where it completely fell apart. Uh, the aircraft was essentially free to accelerate from 140 knots to about 190 knots without any power penalty. And then between about 190 and uh, 200 knots, there appeared to be this artificial wall that I couldn't get past. Uh, this 140 knot point is interesting, and I'll be returning to it later. Upon the 1.1 update, uh, I was forced to rerun all these tests. Um, initial casual flights uh, showed that I couldn't exceed about 160-ish knots, so, so I was hopeful that they'd fixed it. Unfortunately, upon repeating the test, I discovered that the trends no longer match the performance data at all, and uh, the torque required is overpredicted at all airspeeds. Uh, I think that they fundamentally changed the way torque is calculated. Uh, somehow, this allowed them to match the maximum speed, but not the trend that gets in there, uh, and there's still significant work to do here. The flight model is difficult to critique since it can be so subjective and it's difficult to judge objectively without flight test data and the ability to precisely prescribe control inputs. However, we do know a few things. 
the uh, flight model is based on the AH-6 mod, which was released a couple years ago. Um, and my understanding is that mod was a, just a fun little project put together by a single dev, and uh, it was based on data of an OH-6 from a NASA report. And that report contained the uh, stability and control derivatives uh, for a simple linearized six-degree freedom model that, that was appropriate for basic uh, stability and control analysis. Uh, and without going into too much detail, uh, these stability derivatives are organized into a matrix that, you know, given the aircraft state, which is relative to some trim state, uh, the output will be, uh, you know, total X, Y, and Z forces and the pitch roll and yaw moments uh, exerted on the aircraft. Uh, these forces are then converted into accelerations given the uh, mass and inertia of the aircraft, and then they're integrated to determine the velocity, position, and orientation of the aircraft. Um, essentially, they model the aircraft as a whole without considering the individual impact of each part of the aircraft. Uh, in other words, there is no individual rotor model, tail rotor model, inflow model, fuselage, empennage model, etc. Um, it also requires many tables of stability derivatives for different airspeeds and different mass configurations, you know, the external EEEE configurations, etc. Um, and uh, this kind of model is fine for basic stability analysis, and it's very popular for fixed-wing modeling where, you know, the aircraft is flying more or less forwards at all times. Um, but the model will break down in situations where the aircraft is significantly out of trim or wherever there isn't data to support that particular flight condition. I did chat very briefly with the lead dev of the UH-60L mod um, a while ago, and I asked him where he was getting most of his data. He pointed me towards a NASA technical report, uh, that's NASA TM-85-890. Um, interestingly, this report only contains uh, derivative tables up to about 140 knots, which is the same point at which the performance trends in the previous section uh, completely broke down, uh, at least in the original release. Also interestingly, the stability and control derivatives shown in the report were generated from a more mathematically complex nonlinear model uh, that does model the aircraft in a component-wise way. So in essence, the UH-60L's flight model is a model of a model of an aircraft. The stability derivatives were also calculated with the horizontal stabilator operating in the automatic mode. This makes sense, but it brings into question exactly how they're simulating the impact of the stabilator angle in DCS. And I'll be discussing the horizontal stabilator a bit more later. Uh, there could be another source of data or other sources of data uh, that the devs have since added that I'm unaware of, but uh, for the time being, it feels a bit like a black box. As mentioned, evaluating the flight model is a bit difficult as there's a certain amount of subjectivity. Having never flown an actual Blackhawk, I can't comment on the subjective feel of the aircraft. Uh, and this is difficult regardless since differences in hardware between the real-life cockpit and our relatively simple home setups can significantly alter that feel. Uh, and this is one reason why I'm usually very unimpressed and skeptical of uh, claims that you know, a simulated aircraft's flight model has been you know, validated by real pilots. However, we can take a look at general aircraft behavior. Uh, the, the simulated aircraft does fly like a helicopter in most cases. It's actually very easy to fly, even with all the stability systems disabled. There is a subtle ground effect. The original 1.0 release did have a, uh, a VRS model of sorts. Uh, I use the term model here very generously. Entering VRS was excessively easy, uh, only requiring about 100 feet per minute of descent rate or so near hover before the aircraft would essentially fall out of the sky. The 1.1 release has essentially removed the VRS model or made it substantially harder to enter, and I'm largely thankful for this. Uh, VRS seems to be this one thing that simmers erroneously hang on to to judge if a helicopter flight model is good, uh, and this is complete nonsense. A helicopter flight model can be absolute crap, but uh, contain a VRS model, while an otherwise excellent helicopter flight model may lack a distinct VRS model. Uh, it's a special inflow state that needs special consideration, and it's uh, very difficult to model. Uh, honestly, the current flight model is so primitive that uh, including a VRS model right now makes little sense to me. Uh, the model does completely break down in side flight. Um, I can reach side flight velocities of about 100 knots without excessive roll attitudes, lateral stick, and without saturating my pedal input. Uh, longitudinal stick requirements come just about full aft, however, uh, resulting in out-of-control flight. Uh, and this is obviously not realistic. 
um, a substantial increase in fuselage drag and side flight, as well as a stabilizing directional moment, uh, is not being modeled. And I suspect that any side force due to uh, lateral velocity is linear rather than quadratic uh, due to the nature of the linear model. Uh, the flight model may also interpret this as a forward flight condition with the aircraft states way out of trim, uh, resulting in erroneously large forces and moments. Uh, essentially, the assumed linearity of the system has completely fallen apart. There is an engine and rotor speed degree of freedom, but I'm not convinced it's behaving realistically. In the uh, original release, uh, torque would increase if the aircraft was put into a climb with cyclic only. Uh, in reality, the torque should decrease if, uh, as the induced power decreases due to the reduced inflow angle on the blades. Uh, the trade-off, of course, is a decrease in airspeed. Sudden collective increases do result in rotor speed droop, but interestingly, not engine speed droop. The engine speeds shown here on the PDU are power turbine speeds, and with the engines clutched to the transmission, should move in unison with the rotor speed. Uh, you can perform an auto rotation, however, I find maintaining the proper rotor speed to be very difficult, and I feel that this requires a lot of tuning. Uh, the RPM seems to shoot up from 100% point, um, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to control. Uh, I find managing the round out uh, on the flare at the bottom to be excessively difficult, even after many attempts. I think the issue here is that the flight model does not naturally incorporate a rotor speed degree of freedom and engine model. As such, this behavior has to be somewhat layered on top of the simplified linear model. I don't know how all of this is being integrated together, but I must imagine it gets a bit messy. Overall, the flight model is a bit simple when compared to other DCS helicopters. Personally, I think a much more robust approach would be to model the actual physics of that rotor together with the engine and drivetrain and fuselage and empennage and all that. And uh, this would result in a more accurate and comprehensive flight model that doesn't break down under more unusual out-of-trim situations such as side flight, and it would also more organically include the effects of auto rotation and rotor speed droop. This would also permit the simulation of damage to the aircraft at a component level. For example, loss of tail rotor, loss of stabilator, blade damage, etc. And this is particularly important in a combat simulation. This would, of course, require modeling of each component, the most difficult of which would be the rotor, and this is much easier said than done. The Blackhawk contains two major stability systems, the Inner Loop Stability Augmentation System, or SAS, and the Outer Loop Flight Path Stabilization, or FPS, system. The SAS is actually two independent systems, one analog, one digital, that act in series, each with 5% control authority on the pitch roll and yaw axes. Together, the SAS has 10% authority on each axis. The SAS acts to dampen pitch roll and yaw rates and makes the aircraft easier to fly. As such, it should always be engaged. The SAS systems can be activated using the two leftmost buttons on the row of four buttons on the flight control panel. Disabling them will result in a SAS off warning on the warning panel and the master caution light will illuminate. The effects of the SAS systems are transparent to the pilot. The SAS servos are downstream of the pilot inceptors and simply superimpose their command on top of the mechanical stick and pedal positions. Uh, the limited 10% authority means that the pilot can easily overpower the system should it fail or saturate. On the other hand, the flight path stabilization system is different. It's an outer loop system that acts through the trim servos. As such, the trim system must be engaged for the flight path stabilization to work. Uh, the trim system is the third button on this row, and the flight path stabilization is the last. Because the FPS provides its commands through the trim servos, it's essentially an autopilot. With hands off the stick and pedals, the system will physically move the controls to input its commands. It has 100% control authority, but its rate is limited. The pilots can simply overpower the system if necessary. The pilot interfaces with this system through the trim release switches, plural. There is one trim release switch on the cyclic and one on each anti-torque pedal. 
the trim release switch disengages both the trim system and the FPS system for that control, and the control can be moved freely without a restoring force gradient. Upon releasing the switch, the position of that control becomes the new control center, so to speak, and the controls will once again have a spring force gradient about that position. If the FPS system is enabled, the system will also capture the aircraft's state and attempt to maintain it. The exact behavior depends on the airspeed. At low speed, that is less than 60 knots, the FPS system will try to maintain aircraft attitude through the cyclic as well as aircraft heading through the pedals. At high speed, or greater than 60 knots, the situation is more complicated. The longitudinal control will attempt to maintain airspeed, and pedals will attempt to maintain coordinated flight through roll rate and lateral acceleration feedback, i.e. keeping the ball centered. This is called high speed turn coordination. Because there are separate trim release switches for the cyclic and pedals, the trim can be released for these axes independently. For instance, in hover, you can put your feet on the pedals to perform a heading change without touching the stick. In high speed flight, you can fly the aircraft with just the stick and the pedals will automatically coordinate the turn. In high speed flight, you must press both the cyclic and the pedal trim release switches to disable trim for the yaw axes. This basically encourages you to keep your feet on the floor during high speed flight. I should also note that there is the horizontal stabilator. Uh, this is an all-moving horizontal tail that can change its incidence from 40 degrees trailing edge down to 8 degrees trailing edge up. Uh, it is generally fully trailing edge down in hover and low speed, and then moves to trailing edge up in high speed. Positioning the stabilator trailing edge down reduces rotor download on the tail, reducing the nose-up attitude and forward cyclic requirements of the aircraft in low speed flight. The angle is mainly scheduled by airspeed, though collective lateral acceleration and pitch rate feedbacks also contribute. The stabilator can also be manually slewed on the flight control panel using the triangular switch. Uh, to my knowledge, this is never done in flight, and the system is always left in the automatic mode. Uh, a display on the main instrument panel uh, shows the stabilator angle. Uh, the automatic system has failed in the past, uh, resulting in accidents. Uh, the pilot is provided with an emergency override in the cockpit using a paddle switch on the cyclic stick. Uh, and this will command the stabilator to zero degrees to alleviate any excessive nose down moment that would occur in high speed flight uh, should the stabilator be stuck trailing edge down for some reason. And finally, while not a stability system per se, there is the control mixing box. Uh, this mechanically mixes control inputs before the hydraulic servos uh, to keep the commands relatively on axis. For instance, increasing collective increases uh, rotor torque, which tends to result in a uh, right yaw transient in most helicopters, uh, which pilots would have to manually compensate for with left pedal. In the UH-60, increasing the collective stick will increase pitch on both the main and tail rotors at the same time, so that the torque is largely countered without any pedal input. Similarly, because the tail rotors can't at 20 degrees from vertical, there is a significant yaw pitch coupling associated with tail rotor collective pitch. As such, forward cyclic pitch is mixed in with left pedal input such that this increased lift on the tail is compensated for. Uh, collective is also mixed with lateral and longitudinal cyclic to reduce other cross couplings. The UH-60L mod uh, does allow you to enable and disable the SAS, trim, and FPS systems on the flight control panels, just as you would in the real aircraft. Enabling the SAS does seem to impact the flying qualities fairly significantly, especially in hover. Without SAS, the helicopter displays an unstable oscillatory hover mode if controls are held fixed after a disturbance. and the SAS seems to do a good job at stabilizing this. So overall, this seems to behave as it should. Enabling the trim system permits you to change the center position of your controls using the trim release switch, much like you would in any of the other helicopters in DCS. Unfortunately, it seems like you can't trim the pedal position. The FPS system is where things get tricky. Because the FPS system acts through the trim servos, emulating its behavior on typical home simulator hardware is never going to be ideal, unless we have sticks with dynamic control loading, which is also referred to as force feedback. The FPS system as currently modeled in the mod does seem to do a decent job at holding heading and attitude in hover and low speed flight. In high speed flight, it seems to hold attitude more so than it does airspeed and turns don't seem any more coordinated than with FPS disabled. You can see that the ball is not centered and in roughly the same position in both of these cases. It will also fight you if you move the controls without pressing the trim release switch. 
However, it does not seem to move the cockpit controls, neither visually in the 3D cockpit nor in the controls indicator. In other words, it appears to act more like the SAS in that its inputs are not felt at the stick. And uh, this is not the correct way to emulate this behavior. Uh, the stick's trim position should move according to the FPS inputs, uh, much like how the FPS system would actuate the trim servos in real life. Finally, I will add that there is only a single common trim release switch. Uh, there is no independent trim release for the pedal switches. This means that you can't independently release the pedal trim. This, in my opinion, really needs to be fixed, though I understand why it may have been done this way. There are no consumer flight sim pedals out there with the types of switches to detect feet on the pedals. However, for what it's worth, the MI-8 does have the same kind of switches on its anti-torque pedals, and uh, even the first party MI-8 module uh, for DCS doesn't provide separate cyclic and pedal trim release switches. Uh, regardless, I, I don't think it would be unreasonable to expect the ability to map a yaw trim axis release switch, uh, a cyclic trim release switch, and perhaps a common trim release switch, at least to give people options. There does seem to be modeling of the horizontal stabilator. Hovering in manual mode with a trailing edge up results in a nose-high hover attitude and requires a large amount of forward cycling. This is realistic in slow forward flight, but not in a pure hover where the tail would actually be outside the main rotor wake. Entering forward flight with the trailing edge fold down results in an unrecoverable pitch down moment by about 90 to 100 knots or so. This behavior is realistic, and it's why the pilot is provided the emergency slew up switch on the cyclic. Unfortunately, no mapping is provided for this in the controls options. Otherwise, in the automatic mode, it does appear to behave as expected, though there doesn't seem to be any pitch rate feedback, at least none that I could see. So overall, the UH-60L mod is definitely the easiest helicopter to fly in DCS, even with all the stability systems disabled. Uh, this is at least partially due to the overall simplicity of the flight model. Uh, I would expect a more comprehensive flight model to be significantly more difficult to fly. Um, so I would just recommend you avoid you know, side flight and any other places where the current model just completely breaks down. Enabling the flight path stabilization system uh, makes the aircraft particularly stable and easy to fly, as it should. However, it has uh, several oversights in how it's implemented that uh, do need to be corrected. The UH-60L mod does allow you to put an aerial refueling boom on the aircraft and refuel from a uh, KC-130. While this is fun, it's not a feature present on any actual UH-60L. Air Force HH-60G Pavhawks do have them and are similar to the UH-60L. Uh, however, they have a number of other systems and modifications, you know, different cockpit layout and different control grips. Uh, it would be unrealistic to simply slap a refueling boom and a new coat of paint on a Lima and call it a 60G. Regardless, it's a fun addition, and I'd rather have it than not have it. The mod includes a helmet-mounted display, which they say is based on the AN AVS-7. This is a nice addition, but it's not really realistic unless used in conjunction with the night vision goggles, uh, specifically the AN AVS-6 night vision imaging system. In other words, this is realistic, but this is not. Ground handling seems to behave alright. I suspect that there's some baked-in landing gear code that the uh, devs are taking advantage of that interfaces with the rest of the visual world. The tailwheel must be unlocked in order to turn on the ground. Uh, when unlocked, it is free castering. Uh, while tailwheel aircraft are directionally unstable, uh, plenty of tail rotor authority is available to keep you pointed in the right direction assuming you don't over-control it. A lateral cyclic will make the aircraft turn in the opposite direction while on the ground, uh, which is realistic for tailwheel aircraft.
You can lock the tailwheel forward from any position. Uh, this is not realistic. Uh, the tailwheel must pivot to the neutral position via external forces before the pin will lock it. There is only one wheel brake axis that can be assigned in the control options. Uh, in reality, there should be independent left and right brake axes. Uh, having this is especially crucial in a uh, tailwheeled aircraft. I expect this may be a limitation the devs don't have control over, however. The 1.1 release seems to have fixed the visual error in which the tailwheel would turn the wrong way. The rotor blades don't dynamically cone or flap at all, basically keeping the rotor disc rigidly perpendicular to the shaft. This is likely because the rotor is not modeled at all by the flight model, and as such there is no rotor flapping information to inform such an animation. Other helicopters in DCS fully animate the rotor state, which I must assume is informed by their flight model, in which the rotor flapping degrees of freedom are fully modeled. Seeing the response of the rotor disc can be a useful visual feedback to the pilot, so not having it uh, does have implications beyond simple visual flare. I want to emphasize that I understand this is a mod made by enthusiasts in their free time without monetary compensation. It would be unreasonable to expect this to be at the same level of quality as a paid module. That said, the initial releases have had a number of issues that should be addressed, and I bring attention to these issues in the hopes that they will be addressed and fixed, not in a bad faith attempt to blatantly criticize the hard work of the unpaid devs. Again, the UH-60 is my favorite helicopter and many others, and one that would fit right in with DCS next to the upcoming AH-64 Apache. As such, I want to see it done right. I also don't want to trivialize the amount of work that's already been done. This mod has laid the foundation for something that could be really, really great. Unfortunately, it still has a long way to go. And as much as I would love to directly contribute to this project, uh, doing so would likely be a conflict of interest. There have been incidents of people releasing sensitive information, you know, in game forums to help make their, you know, various favorite combat game more realistic, and uh, this has resulted in real-world consequences, and I don't want to end up in that situation. Uh, this video contains sources for all the information I provided, and I don't see any issues here. Uh, however, writing flight model code or authoring 3D models and such for this project uh, would not be a wise decision. Um, it is very frustrating to be in this position knowing that I could really help make the mod better, uh, but being unable to do so. And I'm hoping this video will at least contribute something useful. Uh, overall, I do look forward to seeing how this mod develops. Um, I, I don't think it's at a level yet where I'm going to be flying it very often, considering the uh, various issues that still have to be worked out. Uh, however, it's a nice stopgap until we, hopefully, uh, get an official UH-60 for DCS eventually. Anyway, that's about it. Take care, and as always, thanks very much for watching.